Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara. And Lily's not here, Jamie's out there. And as always, I'd like to remind you to please stay safe and healthy. Hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell. <clears throat> and today we are going to get back in to the Diary of Anne Frank. For all you listeners out there. Thursday, December 10th, 1942. Dear Kitty, Mr. Van Dan used to be in the meat, sausage, and spice business. It was because of his knowledge of, of, his, of this trade that he was taken on in Daddy's business. Now he is showing the sausagey side of himself, which for us is by no means disagreeable. We had ordered a lot of meat under the counter, of course, for preserving in case we should come upon hard times. It was fun to watch, first the way the pieces of meat went through the mensa two or three times, then how all the accompanying agreements were mixed with the minced meat, and then how the intestine was filled with meats of a, means of a spout to make the sausages. We fried the meat sausage meat and ate it with sauerkraut for supper that evening, but the Gelderland sausages had to be thoroughly dried first, so we hung them over a stick tied to the ceiling with string. Everyone who came into the room began to laugh when they caught a glimpse of the row of sausages on show. They looked terribly funny. The room was in glorious in a glorious mess. Mr. Van Dan was wearing one of his wife's aprons swathed around his substantial person. He looked fatter than he is and was busy with the meat. Hands smothered in blood, red face, and the soiled apron made him look like a butcher. Mrs. Van Dan was trying to do everything at once learning Dutch from a book, stirring the soup, watching the meat being done, watching the meat be, being done, sighing and complaining about her injured rib. That's what happens to elderly ladies, one who do such idiotic exercises to reduce their large behinds. Dussel had inflammation in one eye and was bathing, at, bathing it with chamomile tea by the fire. Pim, who was sitting on a chair in a beam of sunlight, that shone through the window kept being pushed from one side to the other. In addition, I think his rheumatism was bothering him because he sat rather hunched up with a miserable look on his face. Watching Mr. Van Dan at work, he looked exactly like some shriveled up old man from an old people's home. Peter was doing acrobatics around the room with his cat. Mummy, Margot, and I were peeling potatoes and of course all of us were doing everything wrong because he was so busy watching Mr. Van Dan. Dussel has opened his dental practice for the fun of it. I must tell you about his first patient. Mummy was ironing, and Mrs. Van Dan was the first to face the ordeal. She went and sat on a chair in the middle of her room. Dussel began to unpack his case in an awfully important way. Asked for some eau de clone as a disinfectant and Vaseline to take the place of wax. He looked in Mrs. Van Dan's mouth and found two teeth which, when touched, just made her crumple up as if she was going to pass out, uttering incoherent cries of pain. After a lengthy examination in Mrs. Van Dan's case, lasting in an actual fact, not more than two minutes, Dussel began to scrape away <coughs> at one of the holes, but no fear. It was out of the question. The patient flung her arms and legs about wildly in all directions, until at one point Dussel let go of the scraper that, reminds, that remained stuck in Mrs. Van Dan's tooth. Then the fat was really in the fire. She cried, <coughs> excuse me, as it was possible with such an instrument in one's mouth, <coughs> tried to pull the thing out of her mouth and only succeeded <coughs> in pushing it further in. Mr. Dussel stood with his hands against his side calmly watching the little comedy. The rest of the audience lost all control and roared with laughter. It was rotten of us because I, <clears throat> for one, am quite sure that I should have screamed even louder. After much turning, kicking, screaming, and calling out, she got the instrument free at last, and Mrs. Dussel went on with his work as if nothing had happened. This he did so quickly that Mrs. Van Dan didn't have time to start any fresh tricks, but he never, he never had so much help in all his life before. Two assistants are pretty useful. Van Dan and I performed our duties well. The whole scene looked like a picture from the Middle Ages entitled A Quack at What Work. 
In the meantime, however, the patient had much patience. She had to keep an eye on her soup and her meal. One thing is certain, Mrs. Van Dan won't be in such a hurry to allow herself to be treated again. Yours, Anne. Sunday, December 13th, 1942. Dear Kitty, I'm sitting cozily in the main office, looking outside through a slit in the curtain. It is dusk, but still just light through enough to write to you. It is a very queer sight as I watch the people walking by. It looks just as if they are all in a terrible hurry and nearly trip over their own toes. We're cyclists now. One simply can't keep pace with their speed. I can't even see what sort of person is riding on the machine. The people in this neighborhood don't look very attractive. The children especially are so dirty you wouldn't want to touch them with a barge pole. Real slum kids with running noses. I can hardly understand a word they say. <laughs> Yesterday afternoon, Margaret and I were having a bath here, and I said, supposing you were to take the children who are walking past one by one, hoist them up with a fishing rod, give them such a, them each a bath, wash and mend their clothes, and then let them go again. Then, Margot interrupted me. By tomorrow, they would look just as filthy and ragged as before. But I'm just talking nonsense. Besides, there are other things to see. Cars, boats, and rains. rain. I like particularly the screen, screech of the trams as they go by. There's no more variety in our thoughts than there is for ourselves. They go round and round like a roundabout from Jews to food and from food to politics. By the way, talking of Jews, I saw two Jews through the curtain yesterday. I could hardly believe my eyes. It was a horrible feeling, just as if I'd betrayed them and was now watching them in their misery. There's a houseboat immediately opposite where Bargeman lives with his family. He was a small yapping he has a small yapping dog. We only know the little dog by his bark and his tail, which we can see when he runs around the deck. Ugh, now it's start start to rain, rain and most of the people are hidden under umbrellas. I see nothing but raincoats and occasionally the back of someone's hat. Really I don't need to see more. I'm gradually getting to know all the women at a glance, blown out with potatoes, wearing a red or a green coat, trodden down heels and with a bag under their arms. Their faces either look grim, depending on uh, their headbands, their husbands, excuse me, disposition. Okay. Tuesday, December 2nd, 22nd, excuse me, Tuesday, December 22nd, 1942. Dear Kitty, the secret annex has heard the joyful news that each person will receive an extra quarter of a pound of butter for Christmas. It says half a pound in the newspapers. That's only for the lucky mortals who get their ration books from the government. Not for Jews who have gone into hiding, who can only afford to buy four illegal ration books instead of eight. We are all going to bake something with our butter. All the suffering, all the suffering the war has brought, but then I would only make myself more dejected. There's nothing we can do but wait as calmly as we can till the misery comes to an end. Jews and Christians wait, the whole earth waits, and there are many who wait for death. Yours, Anne. Saturday, January 30th, 1943. Dear Kitty, I'm boiling with rage and I mustn't show it. I'd like to stay at my feet, scream, give Mummy a good shaking cry, and I don't know what else because of the horrible words, mocking looks, and accusations which are leveled at me repeatedly every day, and find their mark like shafts from a tightly strung bow and which are just as hard to draw from my body. I would like to shout to Margot Van Dan, Dussel and Daddy too. Leave me in peace. Let me sleep one night, at least without my pillow being wet with tears, and my eyes burning and my head throbbing. Let me get away from it all. Preferably away from the world, but I can't do that. They mustn't know my despair. I couldn't bear their sympathy and their kind-hearted jokes. It would only make me want to scream all the more. If I talk at... Everyone thinks I'm showing off. When I'm silent, they think I'm ridiculous. Rude if I answer. Sly if I get a good idea. Lazy if I'm tired. Selfish if I eat a mouthful more than I should. Stupid, cowardly, crafty, etc., etc. Whole day long, I hear nothing else but that I am an insufferable baby. And although I laugh about it and pretend not to take any notice, I do mind. I'd like to ask God to give me a different nature so that I didn't put everyone's 
back up, but that can't be done. I've got the nature that has been given to me, and I'm sure it can't be bad. I do my very best to please everybody, far more than they'd ever guess. I try to laugh it off because I don't want to let them see my trouble. More than once after a whole string of undeserved rebukes, I flared up at Mummy. I don't care what you say, and anyhow, leave me alone. I'm a hopeless case, anyhow. Naturally, I was then told I was rude and was virtually ignored for two days, and then all at once it was quite forgotten and I was treated like everyone else again. It's impossible for me to be all sugar one day and spit venom the next. I'd rather choose the golden mean, which is not so golden, keep my thoughts to myself and try for once to be just as disdainful to them as they are to me. Oh, if only I could. Yours, Anne. Friday, February 5th, 1943. Dear Kitty, although I haven't written anything about our rose for a long time, there still isn't any change. The discord long accepted by us struck, struck Mr. Dussel as a calamity at first, but he's getting used to it now, tries not to think about it. Margot and Peter aren't a bit what you would call young. They are both so staid and quiet. I show up terribly against them and am always hearing, you don't find Margot and Peter doing that. Why don't you follow their example? I simply loathe it. I might tell you, I don't want to be in the least like Margot. She is much too soft and passive for my liking and allows everyone to talk her, talk her around and gives in about everything. I want to be a stronger character. But I keep such ideas to myself. They would only laugh at me. If I came along with this, in, this as an explanation of my attitude, the atmosphere of fear at table is usually strained though luckily the outbursts are sometimes checked by the soup eaters. The soup eaters are the people from the office who come in and are served with a cup of soup. This afternoon, Mr. Van Dan was talking about Margot eating so little again. I suppose you do it. Keep slim, he added, teasing her. Mummy, who always defends Margot, said loudly, I can't bear your stupid chatter any longer. Mr. Van Dan turned scarlet, looked straight in front of him, and said nothing. We often laugh about things, such just recently, Mrs. Van Dan came out with some perfect nonsense. She was recalling the past, how well she and her father got on together, what a flirt she was. And do you know, she went on, if a man gets a bit aggressive, my father used to say, then you must say to him, Mr. So-and-so, remember I'm a lady, and he will know what you mean. We thought that was a good joke and burst out laughing. Peter, too, although usually so quiet, sometimes gives cause for mirth. He is blessed with a passion for, to, for, for foreign words, although he does not always know their meaning. One afternoon we couldn't go to the lavatory because there were visitors in the office. However, Peter had to pay an urgent call, so he didn't pull the plug. He put a notice upon the lavatory door to warn us with SVP gas on it. Of course, he meant to put beware of gas, but the thoughts the other, but he thought the others looked more genteel. He hadn't got the faintest notion it meant, if you please. Yours, Anne. Saturday, February 27, 1943. Dear Kitty, Pim is expecting the invasion any day. Churchill ha hasn't had pneumonia, but is improving slowly. The freedom-loving Gandhi of India is holding his umpteenth fast. Mrs. Van Dan claims to be fatal fatalistic, but who is the most scared when the guns go off? No one else but Petronella. Hank brought a copy of the bishop's letter to churchgoers for us to read. It was very fine and inspiring. Do not rest people of the Netherlands. Everyone is, <coughs> is fighting with his own weapons to free the country. The people and the religion God, give help. Be generous and do not dismay is what they cry from the pulpit. Just like that. Will it help? It won't help the people of our religion. You'd never guess what had happened to us now. What has happened to us now. <clears throat> the owner of these premises sold the house without informing Crailer and Kufuas. One morning, the new owner arrived with an architect to have a look at the house. Luckily, Mr. Kufuas was present and showed the gentleman everything except the secret annex. He professed to have forgotten the key at the communicating door. The new owner didn't question any further. It'll be all right as long as he doesn't come back and want to see the secret annex, because then it won't look too good for us. Daddy, Daddy has an empty a card index box for Margot, me, and put cards in it. It is to be a book card system. Then we both write down which books we have read. If 
who they are by, etc. I procured another little notebook for foreign words. Later, Mummy and I have been getting on better together, but we still never confide in each other. Margo is more catty than ever. Daddy's got something he's keeping to himself, but he's, he remains the same darling. New butter and margarine rationing at table. Each pe person has a little bit of fat put on their plate. In my opinion, the Van Dans don't divide it at all fairly. However, my parents are much too afraid of a row to say anything about it. Pity, I think you should always give people like them tip or tat. It was a Wednesday, March 10th, 1943. We had a short circuit laddie, last evening, and on top of that, the guns kept banging away all the time. I still haven't got over my fear of everything and connected with shooting and planes, and I creep into Daddy's bed nearly every night for comfort. I know it's very childish, but you don't know what it is like. The AA guns roar so loudly that you can't hear yourself speak. Mrs. Van Dan, the fatalist, was nearly crying. Said a very timid little voice, Oh, it is so unpleasant. Oh, they are shooting so hard. By which she really means, I'm so frightened. It d didn't seem nearly so bad by candlelight as in the dark. I was shivering just as if I had a temperature and begged Daddy to light the candle again. He was me. relentless. The light <clears throat> remained off. Suddenly there was a burst of machine gun fire, and that is ten times worse than guns. Mommy jumped out of bed, and to Pim's annoyance with the candle. When it complained, her, an her answer was firm. After all, Anne's not exactly a veteran soldier, and that was the end of it. Have I already told you about Mrs. Van Dan's other fa fears? I don't think so. If I am to keep you informed of all that happens in the secret annex, you must know about this too. One night, Mrs. Van Dan thought she had heard burglars in the attic. She heard loud footsteps and was so frightened that she woke her husband. Just at that moment, the burglars disappeared, and the only sounds that Mrs. Van Dan could hear were the heartbeats of the frightened fatalist herself. Oh, Putty, Mrs. Van Dan's nickname. They are sure to have taken the sausages and all our peas and beans. And Peter, I wonder if he is still safely in bed. They certainly won't have stolen. Peter, listen, don't worry. Let me go to sleep. But nothing came of that. A few nights after that, the whole Van Dan family was woken by ga ghostly sounds. Peter went up to the attic with a torch and scamper, scamper. What do you think was running away? A swarm of enormous rats. And we knew who the thieves were. We let Mooski keep sleep in the attic, and the uninvited guests didn't come back again, at least not during the night. Peter went up to the loft a couple of evenings ago to find fetch some old newspapers. He had to hold the trap door fam firmly to get down the steps. He put his hands down without looking and went tumbling down the ladder from the sudden shock and pain. Without knowing it, he had put his hand on a large rat and it had bitten his hand, him hard. By the time he reached us, as white as a sheet, and with his knees knocking, the blood had soaked through his pajamas, and no wonder, not very pleasant to stroke a large rat, to get bitten into into the bargain is really dreadful. He was there. I guess so. Yuck. Friday, March 12, 1943. Dear Kitty, may I introduce someone to you? Mama Frank, champion of youth. Extra butter, butter for the young. The problems of modern youth. Mummy defends youth and every everything, and after a certain amount of squabbling, she always gets her way. A bottle of preserved soul has gone bad. Gala dinner for Muski and, Bo and Bucky. You haven't ma met Bucky yet, although she was here before we went into hiding. She's the warehouse and office cat. Keeps down the rats in the storerooms. Her odd political name requires an explanation. For some time, the firm had two cats, one for the warehouse and one for the attic. Now it occasionally happened that the two cats met. The result was always a terrific fight. The aggressor was always the warehouse cat, yet it was always the attic cat who managed to win. Just like the, like am among nations. So the storehouse cat was named the German, or Pocky, that's funny. And the attic cat, the English, or Tommy. Tommy was, got rid of, got rid of later. We all entertained, we were all, we were all entertained by Pocky. When we go downstairs. We have eaten so many kid. 
so many kidney beans and haricot beans that I can't bear the sight of them anymore. The mere thought of them makes me feel quite sick. Bread is no longer served in the evenings now. Daddy has just said that he doesn't feel in a good mood. His eyes look so sad again, poor soul. I can't drag myself away from a book called The Knocking Door by Ina Boudier Baker. The story of the family is exceptionally well written. Apart from that, it is about war writers, the emancipation of women, and quite honestly, I'm not awfully interested. Horrible air raids on Germany. Mr. Van Dan, Dan is in the bad mood. The cause, cigarette shortage. Discussions over the question of whether we should or should not use our canned vegetables ended in our favor. I can't get into a single pair of shoes anymore, except ski boots, which are not much use about the house. A pair of rush sandals costing 650 florins lasted me just one week, after which they were out of action. Perhaps Miep will scrounge something up, something under the counter. I must cut Daddy's hair. Pim maintains that he will never have another barber after the war. As I do the job so well, if only I didn't snip his ear so often. Yours, Anne. Thursday, March 18th, 1943. Dear Kitty, Turkey is in the war. Great excitement. Waiting in suspense for the news. Yours, Anne. There's a set foot. There's a footnote down here. Square in front of the royal place. Okay. Sure, what that was for. Friday, November. I'm um, excuse me. Friday, March 19th, 1943. Dear Kitty, an hour later, joy was followed by disappointment. Turkey is not in the war yet. It's only a cabinet minister talking about them soon giving up their neutrality. A newspaper in the dam was crying. Okay. I was saying, yeah, square in front of the royal palaces. Turkey on England's side. The newspaper was torn out of his hand. This is how the new joyful news reached to us to 500 and a thousand gilded notes have been declared no longer valid. It is a trap for black marketeers and such like, but even for people who have got other kinds of black money and for people in hiding. If you wish to hand in a thousand gilded note, must be caught, able to declare and prove exactly how you got it. They may still be used to pay taxes, but only until next week. Dussel has received an old-fashioned foot after a dentist's drill. I expect he'll soon give me a thorough checkover. The Führer's Aller Ger Germanen has been talk talking to wounded soldiers. Listening into listening into it was was pitiful. Question and answer one. Something like this. My name is Heinrich Schleppel. Wounded where? Near Stalingrad. What kind of wound? Two feet frozen off and a f broken joint in the left arm. This is exactly what the frightful puppets show on the radio was like. The wounded seemed to be proud of their wounds. The more the better. One of them felt so moved at being able to shake hands with the Fuhrer, that is, if he still had a hand, that he could hardly get the words out of his mouth. Yours, hand. Thursday, March 25th, 1943. Dear Kitty, yesterday Mummy, Daddy, Margo, and I were sitting pleasantly together when suddenly Peter came in and whispered something in Daddy's ear. I heard something about a barrel falling over in the warehouse and someone fumbling about at the door. Margo was, had heard it too, but when Daddy and Peter went off, immediately she tried to calm me down a bit because I was naturally as white as a sheet and very jittery. The three of us waited in supreme, in, in, excuse me, in suspense. A minute or two later, Mrs. Van Dan came downstairs. upstairs. She'd been listening to the wireless in the private office. She told us that Pim had asked her to turn off the wireless and go softly upstairs, but you know what that's like. If you want to be extra quiet, that each step at the old stairs creaks twice as loudly. Five minutes later, Pim and Peter appeared again, wiped the roots of their hair and told us their experience. They had hidden themselves under the stairs and waited when no result at first. Suddenly, yes, I must tell you, they heard two loud bumps, just as if two doors were banged here in the house. Pim was upstairs in one leap. Peter warned Dussel first, finally landed upstairs with a lot of fuss and noise. Then we all went up in stock, stocking feet to the Dan, Van Dan's on the next floor. Mr. Van Dan had a bad cold and had already gone to bed, so we all drew up closely around his bed and whispered our suspicions to him. Each time Mr. Van Dan coughed loudly, Mrs. Van Dan and I were so scared that we thought he, we were going to have a fit. 
That went on until one of us got the bright idea of giving him some codeine, which soothed the cough at once. Again, we waited and waited, but we heard no more. Finally, we all came to the conclusion that the thieves had taken to their heels when they heard footsteps in the house, which was otherwise so silent. <laughs> now it was unfortunate that the wireless downstairs was still tuned to England and that the chairs were neatly arranged around, around it. The door had been forced, and the air raid wardens had noticed and warned the police that the result might have been then the result might have been very unpleasant. So Mr. Van Dan got up and put on his coat and hat, followed Daddy cautiously downstairs. Peter took up the rear, ar rear armed with a large hammer in case of emergencies. The ladies upstairs, including Margot and me, waited, waited in sus suspense until the gentleman reappeared five minutes later and told us that all was quiet in the house. We arranged that we would not draw any water or pull the plug in the laboratory. But as the excitement had affected most of our tummies, you can imagine what the atmosphere was like when we had each paid a visit to intercession. When something like that happens, heaps of other things seem to come at the same time. As now, number one was that the clock of the western, west, western tour in which I always find so reassuring did not strike. Number two was that Mr. Boston, having left earlier than usual the previous evening, we didn't know definitely whether Ellie had been able to get hold of the key and had perhaps forgotten to shut the door. It was still evening and we were still in a state of uncertainty, although we certainly did feel a bit reassured by the fact that from about 8 o'clock when the burglar alarmed the house until half past 10, we had not heard a sound. On further reflection, it also seemed very unlikely to us that the thief would have forced open a door so early in the evening, while there were still people about in the street. Moreover, one of us got the idea that it was possible that the caretaker of the warehouse next door where was still at work, since in the excitement and with the thin walls, one can easily make a mistake, and what's more, one's imagination can play a big part in such critical moments. So we all went to bed, but none of us could get to sleep. Daddy as well as Mummy and Mr. Dussel were awake. Without much exaggeration, I can say that I hardly slept a wink. This morning, the men went downstairs to see whether the door, outside door was still shut, and everything turned out to be quite safe. We gave everyone a detailed description of the nerve-wracking event. They all made fun of it, but it is easy to laugh at such things afterwards. Ellie was the only one who took us seriously. Yours, Anne. I'm going to stop right there, and I'll be getting into the next video. Saturday, March 27, 1943. And if you enjoyed this video, please hit like button, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell. And also stay tuned for more from the Diary Band Frank. And I'll be getting into the summary analysis of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables as well for Book 4 and Mar uh, 1 through 4 and Mario's. Have a good day.